Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Andrew Parks, the Assistant Director of Lectures and Seminars. I just wanted to thank you for joining us today in the Lewis Lehrman Auditorium and take the opportunity to remind everyone attending in person to please silence your cell phones. For those watching the program online, you're welcome to submit questions by emailing speaker at heritage.org. Additionally, the recording of the program will be available for viewing uh, within 24 hours after the program concludes. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the host of today's program, Thomas Callender. He's the Senior Research Fellow for Defense Programs, focusing on naval warfare and advanced technologies. With that, yes, sir. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us on this cold morning uh, for today's important discussion on the future of the aircraft carrier and the carrier air wing. Uh, those, again, as Andrew said, both those here in person and those uh, watching at home on the live stream. It was over 70 years ago that U.S. naval aircraft carriers supplanted battleships as a preeminent warship with their ability to strike enemy warships or land targets hundreds of miles away. Since World War II, U.S. aircraft carriers and the carrier air wing have operated relatively unthreatened, providing unrivaled air support and power projection capability in every U.S. conflict. In recent years, a growing number of critics are predicting the end of the aircraft carrier era. Op-eds and think tank analysis with titles including, Face it, the mighty aircraft carrier is finished. Too big to sail, U.S. aircraft carriers should go the way of the dinosaurs. And red alert, the growing threat to U.S. aircraft carriers predict the doom and gloom future for the U.S. Navy's aircraft carrier fleet that is assessed to be obsolete, not survivable, or too expensive and too vulnerable. The carrier critics cite the growing threats from long-range anti-ship missiles, such as China's DF-21D carrier killer anti-ship ballistic missile, the proliferation of increasingly quieter attack submarines with advanced torpedoes and anti-ship cruise missiles with ranges in excess of 200 miles, advanced integrated air and missile defense capabilities, such as the Russian-built S-400 surface-to-air missile system, and large numbers of land-based, long-range, fourth and fifth generation fighters. They also argue that the current strike fighter aircraft and their weapons lack sufficient range and or survivability to effectively engage targets in a great power competition denied degraded environment as the carriers pushed farther and farther out by these increased threats. Over, well, over 1,000 miles from the DF-21D and the new DF-21, DF-26, which uh, entered service in uh, spring of this year, has ranges estimated in excess of 2,000 nautical miles. It is a well-documented and analyzed fact that the carrier wing, air wing has decreased in size from approximately 85 aircraft and an unfueled uh, combat range of over 900 nautical miles at the start of the Cold War in the 1980s to the current air wing with less than 68 aircraft and an average underfueled combat range of closer to 600 nautical miles, over 300 miles less than the estimated DF-21D range. In addition, the carrier wing has divested itself of almost all of its specialized aircraft and now consists of fixed-wing combat aircraft that are almost entirely based on the multi-mission fighter attack FA-18, with the exception of the E-2D, the C-2, and the F-35, which is just entering service. This is not the first time the U.S. aircraft carrier has come under attack as being obsolete or unable to meet evolving threats. In the initial years of the Cold War, opponents argued that large aircraft carriers were no longer needed in the age of nuclear weapons and long-range bombers until the Korean War erupted and the U.S. carrier fleet was called on to provide close air support of ground forces in Korea. Then in the 1970s, critics argued the aircraft carrier was irrelevant in a potential Soviet ground invasion of the European theater and recommended refocusing funding for increased ground forces. Later carrier critics argued the aircraft carrier and its air wing could not defend itself from the supersonic Soviet backfire bombers with their long-range supersonic AS-4 kitchen anti-ship missiles. As the threats to the aircraft carrier and its air wing have evolved over the decades, so has the air wing's aircraft, weapons, and tactics employed against these threats. 
addressing advanced surface air missile capabilities in the Vietnam War, long range bombers with anti ship missiles in the Cold War, and now very long range anti ship missiles and an ever persistent uh, C 4 ISR complex. Over the decades, the U.S. Navy has responded with new aircraft, such as the F 14, the E 2 airborne early warning aircraft, and the EA 6 electronic enteric aircraft, and new strategies such as the Cold War's outer air battle. The Navy needs to field new carrier aircraft, both manned and unmanned, and develop new tactics and strategies that offensively attack an ad adversary and exploit its weaknesses rather than being reactive and defending against its strengths, such as large number of missile salvos. Instead, we should focus on killing the archer. To those that are etching the tombstone of the U.S. aircraft carrier, I say this. What can replace the aircraft carrier's unrivaled capabilities and the variety of missions that can, it can accomplish, such as close air support, sea control, large-scale power protection, and defeat of any air defenses? A modern U.S. nuclear-powered supercarrier uniquely possesses a globally deployable provides a global deployable U.S. airfield that can rapidly respond to emergent crises and does not depend on the approval of any host nation. As the legend goes, the first question the president asks when an international crisis erupts is, where is the aircraft carrier? A fixed land air base is drastically more vulnerable to laundering ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and bombers than maneuvering aircraft carrier with a carrier strike group's inherent missile and air defense and electronic warfare capabilities. In addition, the geographic constraints and extreme distances from safe air bases to potential adversary targets in the Indo-Pacific region limit sortie rates that ground-based aircraft can provide. Even long-range penetrating bombers, such as the B-2, of which we only have 20, specifically addressing the threat from carrier-killer anti-ship ballistic missiles. While I do not want to dismiss these as very real threats, I do feel that this is not an insurmountable threat. First, to the best of my knowledge and out in the public, these missiles have yet to be tested against a maneuvering sea target. Second, closing the kill chain with the command, control, communications, computer intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance system against a maneuvering carrier strike group that is employing wartime deception, decoys, and electromagnetic warfare in excess of 1,000 miles with accuracy and the small time delay required to effectively employ these missiles is not insignificant. Third, there is still uncertainty in open sources regarding the accuracy of these missiles. Is it hundreds of meters or tens of meters that would be required to hit a maneuvering ship? If these missiles, with their hypervelocity speeds and terminal maneuvers and the Chinese C-4 ISR network, do work as advertised, they present an extremely challenging threat to the aircraft carrier and its strike group. Some critics have argued that the forward class program should be canceled and the funding used instead to buy increased numbers of more attack submarines and unmanned undersea vehicles, which would be more survival in the de denied degraded environment of near a great power competitor. Even as a retired submariner, I will argue, argue against this. While undersea systems are more survival in the high threat environment closer to a near-peer competitor, a submariner UAV or lots and lots of submarines and UAVs cannot replace an aircraft carrier and its carrier air wing and the capabilities they provide. While the strike group and its air wing are facing ever-increasing threats, I firmly believe that if the United States Navy can build sufficient quantities of fifth generation F-35 strike fighters and potentially a follow-on long-range carrier fighter, long-range, low-observable, unmanned carrier-based tankers, and hopefully a future long-range, low-observable, unmanned carrier attack vehicle, longer range and more survivable weapons, advanced electronic warfare systems, decoys and deception, and the employment of new offensive operational tactics will enable the aircraft carrier to remain relevant for the foreseeable future. Today's expert panels have written extensively and in some cases debated each other head on on the future of the U.S. aircraft carrier 
and whether the Na U.S. Navy should build smaller, lightweight aircraft carriers, the future carrier air wing, and new weapon systems needed by both the air wing and the carrier strike group. I want to thank them all for taking the time from their busy schedules for today's discussion on a topic that I, we all feel is extremely important to the nation and the U.S. Navy. Mr. Brian Clark is a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic Budgetary and Budgetary Assessments, and like myself, a retired submariner. Brian has not only written on this subject in his new analytical paper, Regaining the High Ground at Sea, Transforming the U.S. Navy's Carrier Air Wing for Great Power Competition, but also his 2016 analysis, Restoring American Sea Power, a New Fleet Architecture for the United States Navy. Dr. Jerry Hendricks is a vice president at the Telemus Group and is a retired Maritime Patrol Naval Flight Officer. Jerry has written several papers on the subject of the aircraft carrier, and specifically the carrier air wing, including his 2015 analysis, Retreat from Range, The Rise and Fall of Carrier Aviation. Last but certainly not least, Mr. Brian McGrath, Manager Director of the Ferry Bridge Group and Deputy Director for the Center of American Sea Power at the Hudson Institute and a retired Surface Warfare Officer. Brian has also written extensively on this subject, including his 2015 study, Sharpening the Spear, the Carrier, the Joint Force, and the High-End Conflict. Brian Clark, if you will start us off. Sure. Bring up the slides. All right, there we go. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk today about uh, a study that we just completed, and that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks, um, talking about how the carrier wing should transform to deal with high-end, high uh, great power competition. Uh, I have not talked about this uh, study publicly yet. This is the first time I'll be doing that. Um, so feel free to assail my views, uh, criticize my slidemanship, um, or uh, otherwise find fault with my analysis. Um, but yeah, this is the first time we're going to talk about this. I'm going to highlight some of the elements of the study uh, as a way of sort of introducing some of the issues at play here with the carrier air wing, and that'll maybe provide a starting point for the discussion that'll follow. So the big thing, the kind of the, the 800 pound gorilla here is the fact that countries like China can uh, threaten their maritime approaches with large numbers of weapons that are guided by a very extensive surveillance network. Um, so we talk about the vulnerability of the carrier uh, as a result of this type of precision strike complex. Uh, the, uh, some of the uh, kind of follow-on effects of this uh, approach to uh, warfare that the Chinese, and to a degree the Russians have mounted, is it gives them escalation dominance in their near abroad. It forces us to come in with very robust forces that are able to defend themselves and gives them lots of options for escalation uh, at lower levels uh, below great power war, um, which we have to deal with when we deal with potential gray zone conflicts. So. What, what that means in terms of like how many weapons can the Chinese actually launch at a location out in the, in the water of the Western Pacific. Uh, if you look at this chart, it kinda, it's a little bit small, which uh, I apologize for. But when you add up the number of weapons that can be launched by their shore-based uh, crews and, and ballistic missiles and their bombers that are dropping weapons on a target, uh, you end up with a situation where once you get out to about 1,000 miles from the Chinese coast, you end up with being able to uh, launch about 600,000 pound warheads approximately. Just to get a sense of like, well, what is the scale of this threat that the carrier is going to have to deal with? So in the analysis we did for the fleet architecture study and that we followed up and, and updated for this study, we determined that if the Navy pursues a lot of the air defense capabilities that they've been talking about and some of which have been uh, in development or fielded, uh, they should be able to dramatically improve the uh, carrier strike group's air defense capacity. So if you look on this chart, on the left-hand side, it shows the short range uh, at 30 nautical miles and long range at 100 miles, air defense capacity of a carrier strike group in terms of the number of engagements it might be able to conduct. So on the, uh, in the current day, a carrier strike group's uh, air defense capability capacity might reach 450 or so incoming weapons. That's how many you might be able to defeat in a given salvo. Now that means you're emptying all of your magazines and that all of your magazines were filled with air defense weapons. Um, of course, that's not enough if you're looking at a threat that's at least 600 and maybe more weapons in uh, around 1,000 miles from the Chinese coast. So uh, if you shift instead to what the Navy's talking about doing with its air defense capacity by shifting to shorter range interceptors like the ESSM instead of the SM-2 in terms of loadout, um, adopting uh, directed energy weapons, uh, using the hypervelocity projectile as an air defense capability, you can increase the air defense capacity of your uh, your CSG to the point where now you can deal with 
maybe 800 weapons or so in a particular salvo. Uh, the reason I go into this is because it gets to this issue of carrier survivability and is it worthwhile to continue investing something that, that costs $14 billion and has an air wing that costs several billion dollars more. Well, there is, a th uh, there is a, an approach that could yield a carrier strike group that is, if not in, in or indestructible, but certainly defensible in an area where it could be relevant to a war fight with a country like China. This is the approach that the Navy is moving down the, the track toward. So we should consider this as a, as a way that we might think about having the carrier strike group uh, be able to conduct operations in a contested environment instead of having to withdraw and wait for things to cool off before it's able to come in. So what that means is in terms of, well, if a carrier is going to be useful in war fighting, it's going to have to operate at this thousand miles or more away from the threat um, territory in order to manage the salvo size that it has to deal with to be within the capacity of its air defenses. That means that your carrier strike group, your carrier air wing is going to have to be able to operate at the periphery of great power conflict and then conduct operations into that contested area. Um, meaning if I'm going to deal with a country like a China, I'll have to operate outside the first island chain, maybe even closer to the second island chain, and I'm conducting air operations into the first island chain to either come to the aid of, aid of an ally, conduct sea control, conduct strike operations against coastal and littoral targets like islands in the South China Sea. Uh, similarly, against a country like Russia, the dynamics are a little bit different due to geography, but you're still dealing with a situation where you're having to fly you know, in a thousand miles away into an environment that's contested to support an ally with air operations. Now, the question, one question is, is this useful? You know, and so I, in the wargaming we've done, the analysis we've done, this type of uh, capability is useful. As Tom mentioned, one of the benefits of the carrier is that it is better defended than our land bases. So that's, and if that doesn't change, then there's an option there that provides you tack air from an area that's going to be more defensible than your place, but a place like Kadena or even a place like Guam. Um, also, it's maneuverable, so it does give you the ability to relocate it periodically. It's not moving very fast, but it's moving enough to make its uh, location easier to hide or at least obscure for a period of time. Um, another thing is if you look at the NDS, the ability to put a carrier over in the Middle East, for example, might give you an option to conduct air operations when the rest of the joint force is consumed with a fight with Russia or China. So if you can you know, deal with the opportunistic aggression of a country like in Iran, in a place like the Middle East, if you're not afforded air base uh, options in the Middle East territory of our allies or partners. Um, so what that means in terms of strategy and posture, if you look at the NDS, they talk about this blunt and this contact force. And in our carrier, or rather our fleet architecture study of uh, last year, we talked about this idea of the deterrence forces that are up forward and the maneuver force that is somewhat at a remove. Well, that corresponds pretty closely to the discussion in the NDS about contact forces which are your surface and, and submarine forces in our model um, that are up forward conducting operations day to day with our adversaries and allies. That'll be the first line of defense if an aggress act of aggression occurs. Then they'll be supported by the maneuver force, which in our co concept was the carrier strike groups. They're the forces that operate somewhat farther offshore. They conduct training and exercises with, their, uh, with our allies, with our partners, and they're available to come in when conflict does happen to back up the contact force. And the reason that we thought about that being useful, uh, a useful model is partly because of the kinds of firepower that a missile-based force like submarines and surface combatants compared to a carrier strike group or a carrier air wing is able to generate. So if you look in here, you've got the force composition in the Western Pacific of our proposed deterrence forces, which are basically your surface and submarine forces that are hanging out in the Western Pacific on any given day compared to the, the, the force composition of your maneuver force, which is your carrier strike group, so two carrier strike groups in this case. On the right-hand side, it shows the kinds of number of weapons they can deliver in a single salvo at 800 miles. So the deterrence forces, being you know, if they have a, a re relatively robust missile loadout, can deliver a lot of missiles in a short period of time, but they can do it once. So you're, you're looking at 1,000 weapons potentially being launched by this uh, deterrence force, the combination of the deterrence forces. And then the maneuver force does have some carrier strike group uh, you know, escorts with it, so it can launch a certain number of weapons in the first salvo. And then it's done. And then the question is, well, what happens then? So your contact force does this relatively quickly in, in, in support of a act of, to defeat an act of aggression by a China, in this case. Um, and then they're out of Schlitz. They got no more weapons. They're stuck. They're waiting for somebody else to come to their aid, and they're probably withdrawing. Well, a carrier strike group can continue to conduct strike operations after that because the air wing can continue to reset, reload, and come back with more weapons. So 
If you look on here, you can see that the carrier strike group, uh, or the maneuver force in this case, would be able to launch uh, up to 400 weapons uh, in a continuous, you know, several times a day salvo um, that would continue on until the joint force comes to the aid of those contact forces that were uh, initially conducting the engagement. So we saw that as being a kind of an argument for in the places that a carrier would be able to operate um, and survive, it could be relevant to uh, war fighting, it could be part of this NDS structure of the contact and blunt force, and be able to deliver effects that would be useful. So some of the operating concepts that would be necessary to allow you to do that are a new form of outer air battle, which I won't go into detail, obviously, because it's very complicated, but essentially outer air battle 2.0 at a longer range than compared to the outer air battle of the 1980s, um, because you're having to deal with longer range anti-ship cruise missiles. So you kind of push all that out, and you're doing outer air battle at a much longer range. Also, you're able to do outer air battle not in support of the carrier itself, but also in support of land bases that might be in this area. So you can see in this picture, Guam happens to fall in the area that's covered by this carrier strike group's uh, outer air battle. So it can augment the um, air defenses of this ground, ground base um, that we also need for larger aircraft to be able to operate. Um, you would also need to think about how do I do offensive operations, and Tom talked about that. So you need new models for how do I do detection of submarines and surface ships, and then do I use my aircraft carrier, um, carrier air wing aircraft to do pouncing operations to engage those contacts. So we can talk about that more. But we talk about using a distributed sensing network um, that's a combination of things on the water, under the water, and up in the air uh, and in space to find contacts that are then engaged by the carrier strike group strike aircraft. So the, the question then is uh, if you have this, if that's how you're going to have to operate you know, in the places that you're going to conduct carrier air wing operations. Is our carrier air wing set up to be able to support that? And we argue it's not. If you look at, this goes to what Tom was talking about earlier, um, on the bottom there, with all the x-axis is range, the y-axis is payload. You can see that our early fighters and attack aircraft of like the World War II, early Cold War era, all kind of fell in that lower left-hand corner. Then during the Cold War, we built some larger attack aircraft. Those show up on that upper right-hand side. Um, they were relatively slow, relatively ungainly, but they had a lot of payload and a lot of range. And then we went, you know, to the multi-mission approach that we've got now, which is we gave up some uh, payload and, and uh, to be, rather we gave up some range to be able to uh, sustain payload and have an aircraft that was potentially faster and more maneuverable. And now we've got the F-35 and the F-18. So it's kind of in the middle there and it doesn't necessarily provide the range that we need to support these kinds of operations, um, even though it does give you a similar payload to previous generations of aircraft. So what we're proposing in terms of future air wing is a air wing that's got a much larger component of unmanned aircraft, unmanned combat air vehicles, like Tom was saying, that gives you the range to be able to extend out and conduct things like outer air battle or, or long range surface warfare and strike at ranges of more like 1,000 to 2,000 miles from the carrier. Um, it retains uh, some, some small number of fighters that we look at uh, evolving into a more fighter-focused aircraft. So it's got F-35s in it because we're buying those now. It's also got a, a specialized fighter that is a you know, modified version of today's aircraft but made more like a fighter. So longer range, um, emphasis on being able to support attack aircraft coming from shore. Um, we look at going to an unmanned version of the uh, airborne electronic attack aircraft. And then in terms of the tanker, and we'll probably talk about this, we, we have the MQ-25 on there. And then we added to it, uh, over time, we see this UCAV being a aircraft that we would evolve into being a follow-on version of the tanker because it would likely give more fuel. Um, in terms of what that generates in terms of striking power, um, you can see uh, the capacity of these uh, aircraft, uh, to, this air wing, to be able to deliver strike weapons uh, decreases uh, with range, as you would expect, but the one that's, uh, that we're proposing compared to a more balanced one, which is a mix of unmanned and manned aircraft, or a strike rider focused one, which is kind of the way the Navy is going right now, um, those two drop off dramatically as you go out to longer ranges. And then uh, if you look at the, the big impact here in terms of going to a larger portion of unmanned aircraft in the carrier wing is you get a fewer number of aircraft are necessary to fill out your air wings. And this, this is the, shows the number of aircraft you have in carrier aviation over time. But you can see the number goes down um, as you go out to 2040 and your air wing uh, becomes more and more unmanned. And as a result, this, this balance, or the, rather this proposed air wing, ends up being less expensive than the, the uh, ones that the Navy might be driving toward or a balanced one that mixes manned and unmanned aircraft because you're buying fewer aircraft in the out years. 
So that's 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 the the summary of our pitch. Hopefully, I didn't go too far over time, and it's over to you, Tom. Great, Jerry. I turn it over to you. All right. It was uh, first of all, thanks uh, to Heritage for inviting me to participate, and uh, certainly, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with my two colleagues. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes I spend my day with the Bobs. <clears throat> Other days I spend my day with the Jims, and today I get to spend my day with the Bryans. Uh, so it, uh, it's, it's always an enjoyable time. Um, <clears throat> one of the statements made earlier today about uh, uh, the question of where are the carriers as being a predominant question in the strategic environment. Well, in the A2AD environment, uh, that, that question cuts both ways uh, because now our enemy is asking that question on the opening salvo as well. There is, and, and this has triggered a heightened national aversion to risk uh, in the United States for a couple of different reasons. One, uh, and I think this is something uh, that we have to take on head on, is that carriers have gone beyond mere naval platforms to become near mystical symbols of American national power. Uh, so uh, they, they are the symbol of the nation, its greatness and the way uh, that they are perceived as an asset of national prestige. The carrier costs has also increased over time, meaning they represent a larger portion of the Navy and the shipbuilding budget, uh, with one carrier, uh, if we purchased it all in one year, occupying nearly 80% of one year shipbuilding budget. Downsizing of shipbuilding and ship repair facilities means that if a carrier is knocked out, uh, and by that I mean mission killed in the sense that it has to go into a repair yard, it will either have to operate into de a degraded mode or it's going to be out for a while because at this time, there's essentially three dry docks uh, where that carrier can be serviced. Uh, presidents may well be hesitant to introduce carriers inside dense portions of the enemy's threat environment. Uh, and I say presidents uh, and not the military. The military may make that advice based upon the mission and that they've been given. But the president may be hesitant to introduce uh, inside the dense portion of the enemy's threat environment for fear of a loss of national prestige or even their political power. For the loss of an aircraft carrier will have a significant impact on the national conversation. Because of this growing sense of risk, the Navy has become increasingly focused on defending the carrier over the past 50 years. So during the Cold War, there was an increased perception of threat that led to the development of the composite warfare commander concept as the guiding principle of battle group command. This led, in turn, to the rise of what I call the antis. Anti-air commander, the anti-surface commander, the anti-submarine, and then later this was modified in the undersea warfare commander. And then there was the strike warfare commander. And this proportion, three antis to one striker, is kind of the way that the, we began to operate and perceive the carrier that a greater preponderance of effort was given to the idea of defending the carrier rather than the projection of power. The battle group has shrank over time. When I first deployed in the early 1990s, the carrier uh, strike group that I was with was made up of two cruisers, two DDGs, guided missile destroyers, two DDs, because we had the Speronces still around, two FFGs, and two fast attack submarines that were armed with both offensive and defensive weapons. So at that point in time, adding all that up, I came up with 646 missile tubes or cells within that strike group. Today, the number of escorts has shrank considerably. Many of our carriers are seen to be operating with one CG, one DDG, and one SSN. Sometimes the allies come alongside and provide escort. And that missile loadout biased is moved decidedly towards the defensive. So if you look at that, that's 230 missiles, with that limiting the mass of the long-range strike from those missiles. So this places more responsibility on the carrier air wing over time. <clears throat> During the classic Cold War, the air wing concept of operation was to fight 1,000 nautical miles or more beyond the carrier. Brian has already gone into this, and I've written about it in the past as well. After the Cold War, however, assumptions changed. So assumptions now included accessibility. I'm going to park my carrier up in the Adriatic when I'm hitting Yugoslavia, and I don't really have to worry about what's coming out to get me, and permissive environments. Long-range aircraft such as the A3 Sky Warrior, the A6 Intruder, the F-14 Tomcat, and the S-3 Viking were sundown, along with their mission tanker variants, so the KA-3, the KA-6, and even the S-3. During Desert Storm, we had two A-6 squadrons, two F-14 squadrons, two F-A-18 
legacy squadrons, so ABCDs, per air wing for a total of 84 aircraft with around a 900 nautical mile average unrefueled range with an average ordnance carrying capacity of 12,800 pounds. Today, uh, that's been replaced um, by essentially four FNA-18 squadrons. Now, mind you, these are E's and F's. And the FA-18, you gotta have to understand, was designed as a light attack replacement for the F-4 and the A-4. That was essentially its design structure. And today, that air wing with those four FA-18 squadrons has shrunk down to around 62 to 68 airplanes with around a 500, 500 plus nautical mile unrefueled range. And the ordnance carrying capacities remain largely the same, right around 12,000, just a little bit down a tick, because the Super Hornets can carry a, a heavy load. And they're also embarked, and this is another significant change in our cost calculation, on an aircraft carrier that costs twice as much as the carrier that preceded it. And that's, a, that's essentially a minimum projection. So the USS Ronald Reagan, which was the last baseline of Nimitz class, because the Bush was always viewed as a transition carrier. The Reagan originally costed out at $4.5 billion and if we had, in $2,000. And if we adjust that today, that's about 6.7% or $6.7 billion uh, inflation adjusted. And there's a GAO report that estimates the Ford uh, cost is coming in in excess of $15 billion. So 12.9 plus the O&M cost and to repair things, and there's still repair activities going on uh, with some major systems to include the weapons elevators. So if the carrier is to remain relevant, and I do want it to remain relevant, there are six things that must happen. One, the carrier air wing must increase its range by investing in an unmanned air combat strike platform that should have a, a, a carrying capacity to carry about 2,000, or sorry, 6,000 pounds of ordnance at about 1,500 to 2,000 nautical miles. We must drive down CVN procurement costs to make them both affordable and riskable so that you don't get a sticker shock at what I'm about to send in the harm's way. We must expand our defense industrial base, both in production and on the repair side, so that we can build new carriers while repairing battle damage ones simultaneously. There are only three certified dry docks in this country where we work on the supercarriers, where we can build one and then we repair two. There are two more in Philly that we used to have that can take a carrier, but they are not currently certified to do uh, carrier or defense related activities. They've been taken over by a civilian uh, firm and they build civilian ships up there. Um, we need to develop a more robust joint CONOPS, uh, potentially with the United States Air Force B-21, wherein maybe the carrier air wing can provide uh, uh, protected salience where uh, tankers could refuel the B-21s, thus allowing the 21 more maneuver and persistence uh, time over its targets. There you have an all-aspect stealth uh, bomber that can go in and hit things ashore. Uh, but one of the things we need to do is make sure that it can get fully refueled in a protected way. So perhaps the carrier and its present air wing can provide that, that salient where, where they can go and do that refueling operation protected uh, by, the, by the carrier. We need to develop logistics nodes uh, in and around the Pacific. So there's a conversation going on right now about uh, Manus Island and the Lombrum uh, Naval Base that's there at uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, where the Australians, the United States, uh, and, and Papua New Guinea are working together to refurbish that. During World War II, we staged the invasion force for the Philippines in that bay associated with that island. It took 400 ships into the bay. It's a deep water bay. But the idea of not only refurbishing that logistics node, uh, which has a long runway near it, but perhaps others spread out beyond the A2A distance uh, strike range from China so that carriers can operate there, be resupplied there, refueled, reloaded with food and, and ordnance in order for them to persist longer. And then we need to begin uh, as a nation to have a conversation that prepares the American people for war. There is, uh, unfortunately, the heavy potential of conflict coming, but the nation is not ready for heavy battle damage to its Navy and specifically not to its aircraft carriers. And we need to move these assets back into the realm of being weapons and not being perceived as mystical unicorns. So 
with that. Thanks, everybody, for coming out today and for your interest in this important topic. Thank you, Tom, for the invitation. I really appreciate it. And to be uh, considered in this company is, is an honor. Um, growing up as I did, a child of the 80s and a committed conservative, the uh, opportunity to speak at Heritage is sort of like getting a hit, uh, face, a batter, face, face a pitcher at Yankee Stadium. Uh, this is the big time, and I really appreciate it. Um, we're here to talk about aircraft carriers, if it isn't obvious by now. It's a subject that I have talked about and written about quite a bit over the last few years. I am rightfully associated with those who hold that the large nuclear-powered aircraft carrier remains a wise investment of the taxpayer's money for the simple reason that I believe the aircraft carrier remains uncommonly useful in accomplishing the purposes to which it is applied. My views on these matters are well documented, uh, and I invite your attention to the Hudson Institute study that Tom mentioned earlier that uh, Seth Cropsey, Tim Walton, and I worked on. And those views are uh, encapsulated again in the, in the poor contribution I made to Brian's majestic um, CSBA fleet architecture from last year. Uh, I'll return to some of those larger views towards the end of my chat, but I'd like to focus a bit on one important aspect of this question that arose one day in 2016 when Brian Clark and I had a bunch of maps on the floor of his office and were trying to build the architecture. Um, he had brilliantly fixed on this idea of a deterrence force, optimized for what he uh, predicted would be a shift from a stance of conventional deterrence uh, by punishment, which is what we had been doing, to one of denial. And he advocated very forcefully for that in this document. Um, that shift, I'm not going to say that the, nas the national security strategy of 2018 um, picked up on Brian's thinking, but um, that shift occurred. If you read the national security strategy, it's one of the, one of the really big ideas in that document is this shift from punishment to denial. Um, anchoring the deterrence force in, in the architecture uh, in, in providing the day-to-day -day power projection uh, are a fleet of small carriers built at least initially on the, uh, on the backbone of the existing amphibious assault ships, um, eventually evolving into a purpose-built ship that would feature 16 to 25 F-35Bs while redistributing the, the uh, other air assets to a more numerous amphibious force. Uh, as we talked about this, I had a uh, uh, Richard III moment, right? For want, of a, for want of a nail, a kingdom was lost. And I thought for a second that um, there was nothing in this fleet architecture more important than the F-35B. Because if the F-35B was fielded and delivered on its promise, we would be able to do uh, much of this deterrence, day-to-day -day power projection knitting from these smaller carriers, um, which would then flee, free up the larger carriers for other activities that I'll talk about shortly. So I, I had this moment there where I thought the most the single most important acquisition program in the United States Navy is the F-35B. I'm not getting any money from Lockheed to tell you that. Uh, that's something that I believe. And apologies to my friend, the CNO, uh, who believes it's some other weapon system, but I think it's the F-35B. Because the F-35B allows you to split the force. The F-35 is the thing that allows you to have a deterrence force and a maneuver force. If we're still using AV-8Bs, we just can't do that. We can't do it confidently, and we won't, wouldn't be able to carry off the um, uh, conventional deterrence mission. Uh, all of this is a roundabout way of saying that I am a huge advocate of smaller, less expensive aircraft carriers. I believe that Senator McCain and his agents on the Senate Armed Services Committee were mostly right in bringing this subject up forcefully in the past few years. 
where the late senator was wrong and where his, his staffers remain wrong to this day is that those smaller carriers should not be procured as a replacement for larger carriers, but as a supplement to them. For Brian's brilliant fleet architecture to work, we have to have both. We need smaller carriers in the 50,000 ton range, primarily employing these F-35Bs, along with an as yet undeveloped medium altitude, long endurance UAV to act as a hybrid early warning ISR asset. The F-35s in this architecture must have an as yet unprospected method of passing data back to the shooters and an as yet undeveloped method of receiving data from the as yet undeveloped airborne early warning UAV that I mentioned. Uh, couple this level of F-35 immigration with more numerous amphibious ships employing offensive anti-ship missiles and land attack missiles and this small carrier centric deterrence force takes on a new level of lethality in pursuing conventional deterrence. So that's the small carrier and the small carrier based deterrence force, but we obviously need large, fast nuclear uh, powered aircraft carriers. We need them removed from the relentless presence demands of the greedy combatant commanders so that they are able to routinely experiment and exercise in multi-carrier, multi-air wing, truly integrated operations. The kinds that are suggested by the ops concepts that Brian talks about in his report, um, and that Tim Walton, Seth Cropsey, and I wrote about a few years ago. By this, I don't mean you know one carrier flying at night, one carrier flying in a day, or one fl carrier flying on Tuesday, another carrier flying on Wednesday. I'm talking about two to four aircraft carrier air wings fighting as a system. Imagine how powerful 80 fighters in the air at one time against a massed uh, flight of uh, fourth and fifth generation fighters coming from the beach would be. Um, it's the only way that we could deal with that threat. Uh, and we need to be able to produce the conditions where those air wings can practice this, right? We don't want them going out there and practicing it at sea the first time. Uh, we want them to have a virtual environment to be able to, to be able to test these out. So if you think of the movie Ender's Game, right? And you think of, that's what I have in mind for, for what goes on at Fallon 20 years from now, where you have a bunch of uh, air wing staffs fighting a war and testing out the first 50 things we need to do to integrate four carrier air wings, and then go out and practice it. But you never get multi-carrier air, air wing operations except luckily and as, a, and as a, a fortunate circumstance when those carriers are devoted to the heel-to-toe presence mission as they are today. Give that mission to these smaller carriers that uh, Brian uh, architected in the CSBA study and the larger ones come out into the maneuver force. I can hear it now. McGrath just doesn't get it. He never has. <laughs> Aircraft carriers are just big, vulnerable targets. We're never going to risk a 100,000 ton, $15 billion carrier in war, and we won't risk a 50,000 ton, $8 billion carrier either. That's too many eggs in one basket. We need to distribute that firepower and put it underwater. These statements bother me. They vex me. Um, but as this is a special time of year, <laughs> the holiday season, it is important to put these vexations into a proper perspective. But if you think I'm talking about the Christmas holiday, you're wrong. I'm talking about Frank Costanza's genius holiday from Seinfeld, Festivus. And the first event of Festivus is the airing of grievances. And that's what I'm going to do right now. Uh, my grievances are with the carrier critics who erect straw man arguments built on false choices, lazy analysis, historical inaccuracy, and operational illiteracy. To quote Frank Costanza, I've got a lot of problems with you people, and you're going to hear about it. <laughs> my first grievance is with those who, as others on this panel have so eloquently described, conflate the aircraft carrier with the carrier air wing. 
What Jerry uh, describes as the retreat from range is not a design feature of the aircraft carrier, but a natural and predictable result of air wing evolution after the end of the Cold War and the, primacy, the rising primacy of US Navy power projection at the time. Given the, rising, the considerable and rising threats to that primacy today, it is only natural that the air wing will evolve again. The Navy appears to be moving so in a determined fashion, though I wish that it would do so faster. My second grievance is with those who are fixated on what they consider to be the vulnerability of the carrier. My objections flow from several directions. First, it has ever been thus. Since the dawn of carrier aviation, those targeted by the aircraft carrier have devised and implemented strategies to neutralize it, beginning with the kamikaze, moving then into submarines and torpedoes, and finally into the missile age, with threats lost from land, sea, air, and undersea. The aircraft carrier has always been vulnerable. Uh, and that is why the fleet integrates in the manner, or it, uh, has evolved in the manner that it has. The fleet fights as an integrated system, using its considerable undersea advantages, overhead ISR, land-based maritime patrol, and surface forces to seize and exploit local temporal sea control in order to project power. There exists among the operational Ill operationally illiterate the sense that the aircraft carrier steams into the teeth of the battle and remains there in sanctuary. That's not the case. Brian, uh, Brian Clark's work that he, he just completed uh, describes why that isn't the case very eloquently. Moving along in the subject of vulnerability, I want to ask what isn't vulnerable in the modern battlefield? The hider finder problem is increasingly inexorably moving in favor of the finder. Additionally, if vulnerability were the only measure against which American force structure and posture were measured, 45 years of troops in Europe and 60 years of troops in North Korea have some splaining to do. <laughs> My next grievance is with the folks who rightly claim that if we just cannibalized a few carriers and threw the money devoted to building, maintaining, and equipping them, at more missiles and unmanned AI-infused UAVs and submarines, we'd have more killing power to win great power war. And if what you're worried about is fighting and winning great power war, this sort of thing has to be considered. But that shouldn't be the only thing we're worried about. We need to be worried about deterring great power war. And while the capabilities I just mentioned are spectacular methods of conducting great power war, they are somewhat less effective as conventional deterrence. We need to remember that great power competition does not equal great power war. And the competition part has a large component of conventional deterrence bound up in it, at least when one considers the military contributions to the competition. No other platform in the Navy's arsenal, dare I say in the military's arsenal, comes anywhere close to the aircraft carrier for utility across the range of uh, operations, of military operations, from peacetime deterrence all the way up to great power conflict. Those who would ar harvest the carrier to devote its resources to other ends bear the responsibility of explaining how they would replace and at what cost they would replace the, resp the, uh, impact, the carrier's impact across this range of operations and how they would do so across the 50-year lifespan of an aircraft carrier. That's enough airing of grievances for now. Let's move on to the feats of strength. Happy Festivus. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you both Brian's and Jerry uh, for some uh, very well thought out uh, analysis and remarks here this morning. Um, so part of my, uh, my thought process on today's events is not only uh, highlighting some of the analysis you guys have done, but um, in, in Brian uh, McGrath's uh, uh, his kind of focus on airing grievances is address some of these uh, continued uh, you know, uh, arguments and uh, arrows that are being slung at the, uh, the aircraft carrier and some of these things out there. 
um, regarding that and, and to also uh, follow up on some of your comments um, with this. You know, and so going on, following on on, on the lightweight carrier uh, piece, which Brian talked about, and I know, Brian, you've written extensively about in there also, um, there are those that are, you know, opposed to that, whether it's in, it is a supplement or a replacement, um, you know, and they cite that, you know, even with the F-35B's increased capabilities, um, it's more limited in range, uh, you know, inability <coughs> of current, you know, if we're mo unless we do heavy modifications to the LHAs um, to provide organic tanking and organic airborne early warning um, and the smaller number of aircraft and sorties um, on there to say, hey, this is really sufficient to do that. Uh, to do that mission set for the it, the cost you're going to do so, um, so I put it to Brian and, and down Brian and Jerry down the house. I guess so. Any additional thoughts uh, you guys have on this debate, um, whether it's a supplement or a replacement in this regard? Uh, yeah. So I'll just so Brian when he brought up the idea of using the um, LHAs as light aircraft carriers, I thought it was a great idea. And then we realized not only was it a great idea as a um, complement to the big carriers as a way of providing that fixed wing capacity to the deterrence force or in the name or in the, the context of the NDS, the uh, contact force. Uh, also, we looked at it from the perspective of amphibious operations because the challenge you run into right now with the ARGS construct is um, if you're having, having to conduct um, amphibious operations from longer ranges due to the threat of anti-ship missiles at, on any territory that you might want to land on, you're going to have to do that at longer and longer ranges. The only thing you can have that, that goes longer ranges is an MV-22. You can't provide fires for anybody that's being delivered via MV-22, though, from the ARG, because your attack helicopters can't go that far. Um, the only thing you can use is an F-35B. So you have to have enough F-35Bs on your, in your ARG to support your amphibious operations at the kinds of ranges they're likely to have to occur at. So from the uh, amphibious and marine perspective, that was, one of the, that was one of the drivers behind us talking about making the uh, LHA into a light carrier, as well as this idea of it being uh, a key component of the deterrence force. Jerry, your thoughts? So, you know, the fleet architecture, you know, when we had uh, 585 ship Navy, you know, and, and 15 carrier strike groups, three of those carriers were actually light carriers. Uh, so you had uh, Midway class, uh, Coral Sea was there, Midway was there, Ranger was there for a while. A couple of those carriers were actually uh, three catapult carriers, which actually only had two working. Um, so we got rather used to working with a carrier uh, that was smaller to essentially do a you know, utility infielder. Um, and in fact, there's a great photograph of four carriers operating together during Desert Storm. And it's very easy to spot Midway there, uh, you know, considerably smaller. She's only about 78,000 tons fully loaded out, uh, as opposed to the big Nimitzes that are around her, which are coming in at 95,000 tons at that point in time. Uh, and so you can see that. My, my concern with the utility carrier um, is, is the, it actually goes to one of the, the points which I disagree with Brian on, uh, which is the, the F-35B. Um, and the F-35B is a good stealth fighter. The problem, though, is in a Stovall takeoff configuration, its range is limited. And to me, range is paramount in importance in trying to span um, the, the gap on these things. So if you're in an A2AD environment with uh, something like the 400s or, or some of the advanced Chinese missiles, the ability to stand out and launch if I have a fully loaded uh, F-35B that's doing essentially a short takeoff, uh, uh, takeoff, its its range is, is going to be somewhat limited. So I'd rather see uh, a medium-sized carrier that has a catapult arrangement so that I can I can give a greater push to that aircraft going off to extend its range once it gets off. Thanks, Jerry. Brian, any McGrath, uh, any further uh, rejoins? Yeah. Um when, uh, when we took on the carrier study at Hudson three summers ago, um, it was born in an in, in a idea that I had that was, I mean, I was mad. <laughs> I don't spend that much time mad. But, uh, I was mad because it looked to me that because we weren't talking about China in the terms that I believed we needed to be talking about China, we were... At the same time, the great aircraft carrier debates were underway again. They had flared up. We were missing an opportunity to talk about the aircraft carrier in that high-end fight 
because we weren't talking about the high-end fight, the most stressing fight, um, or at least the Navy wasn't. And I said, I'm going to go out there and, and with my team, and we're going to write this thing that makes the case that this capability has a huge role in the high-end fight. Break. As we went around and we were talking to the, we, we, we went over to the Pentagon, and we were talking to CNO and his, and his team, um, th there was an especially uh, sense of pride that I think that it, this is just after the ISIS thing started to uh, pop up. Um, that the that it, the aircraft carrier that was there was the only ship avail the only way to provide TAC air to that fight for some fifty four days, um, and I thought to myself, well, okay, great, but that's not why we build aircraft carriers. Um, the the jeep carrier, the light carrier that uh, Brian described in the CSBA fleet architecture with a modest sized air wing or even the one that Jerry just described, a little larger with cats and whatever, is, is, one, is perfectly sized to do those sort of presence everyday missions, the kind of knitting that we do around the world in regional contingencies. The, 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 the supercarrier is somewhat less efficient in those missions. And sending them out one after another and the readiness uh, bill that comes in doing so to go off and do that daily knitting seems to me to be a less efficient use of those carriers. I think they should be involved in this high-end warfare training, both with allies and among ourselves. So the, the utility of the light carrier is in that it is more, it, it, it brings sufficient punch to do most of the, uh, the, the strike and power projection things we need on most days around the world. Thank you. Um, to follow up on uh, you know comments that uh, especially Jerry and, and Brian Clark gave on, on the carrier air wing, you know, and looking forward and, and changes to it to uh, to kind of get its back its capabilities and range. I think most of us agree uh, here that we need to bring the range back. So uh, with that, you know, so I like your thoughts on you know whatever the you know the top two or three priorities you see for. Um, really restoring some of those capabilities back to the, the future carrier air wing. Um, and with that one, you know, touching on, you know, the Navy's now one uh, carrier-based, you know, unmanned uh, aircraft, you know, the current RQ-25, which was originally planned to be a, you know, unmanned potential strike, then carrier and ISR and, and, and that piece going forward. And if there's any other real focus areas you see, and also, as we've seen the size of the carrier shrink and the carrier air wing shrink uh, over time, I think a lot of that's been driven by, by just the, the funding realities, especially as uh, aircraft uh, become more expensive, right? Even the, the Super Hornets and now on to the F-35Cs, which are in excess of $100 million each, is, it seems to be a lot of what's driving the force structure in that regard. So um, from that perspective, your thoughts on both, hey, do we need to, if we can get the funding, increase the size of carrier ring to make it better able to, uh, to fight, and then uh, you know addressing some of the unmanned systems. To, to so I, you know, I first of all, I don't I don't agree that it actually was cost driven. This is one of the reasons why the carrier wing came down. I think actually it was it was part of a, a strategic blindness uh, because the air wing's decrease in size has come because we vacated missions. So for instance, there's there's no replacement for the S three Viking which is a, a medium-range anti-submarine warfare platform. You get the idea of your helicopters doing your inner zone defense. The Viking was supposed to be the medium zone, and then your, your P-3s and now the P-8 were supposed to be your outer zone. We essentially have vacated the, 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 mid, the medium zone. We don't have enough fast attack submarines to fill that, and the helos don't have the range to be able to go out there and really blanket that area. So we essentially said, well, I'm going to operate in an undersea warfare dominance environment where I really don't have to worry about that. So boom, there goes those airplanes. Um, there's other aspects of it that, you know, we, we vacated the long range mission. Uh, part of the bottom up review after a desert storm, we looked at it and said, Air Force, you've got long range strike. Navy, you don't have to do that. We don't need to have uh, uh, duplication of, of duties there. And so that went away. And again, we based on the idea that somehow we were going to operate in a permissive environment. We could park our carriers close to shore. We could go with a light attack, short range 
fighter and be able to get most of the stuff done. And of course, we zigged and the world zagged, and and here we are. Um, you know, because you know, the other the other guy gets a vote, and China's voted uh, in in a big way. Uh, so far as the way out of this, uh, first of all, I don't view MQ25 as as uh, particularly the one that we've selected as being a good investment. Uh, I wanted to go in, and my own thoughts that you needed to have an aircraft that could, at minimum, fully refuel two F-35 Charlies from 500 to 600 nautical miles in order to maximize their extension of range. And if I had four of those aircraft to be able to take uh, six to eight uh, F-35 Charlies, that would have been an investment in buying back range. As it is, we went with a platform uh, which will not be able to fully refuel F-35 Charlies. Uh, may fully refuel uh, F and 18 E and Fs, but that's, that's not what I'm going to send deep on this type of a situation. What I would have liked to have seen is a significant investment in an unmanned combat aerial vehicle uh, that had all aspect stealth capability that would have had that 1,500 nautical miles to 2,000 nautical mile range that could have doubled as a mission tanker. So if I could have bought two squadrons of those and then had uh, two of the airplanes be essentially tanker variants, uh, then that would have gotten me back into the game. If we were able to duplicate the, the two A6 squadrons that the carrier air wings had at Desert Storm with something like a UCAV uh, that had tankers organic within it, then I think we're doing it. But we, we bypassed that because I think the, the light attack uh, community is essentially that, that their mindset is not looking deep. And so we're going to have to overcome sort of that tribal condition of the, the shorter range strategic mindset. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Either the Brian's any further comments uh, on that? Yeah, so uh, we we are advocating in the, the study we just completed a, a similar air wing to what you know Jerry is discussing there. We think you know going, going uh, to longer ranges is going to be necessary based on the areas in which carriers are going to have to operate in order to be able to actually deliver firepower. Um, you know that the, in the a thousand mile or so from a from a threat area, you're able to continue to generate sorties. If you get closer, you tend to be to, too focused on defense and maybe maneuvering so much that you can't really generate useful numbers of sorties. So if you're out at that thousand mile range, you're having to maybe do operations at up to a thousand miles and need long endurance to be able to conduct things like outer air battle at longer ranges or to defend ground targets from uh, air attack and attack the archer before they launch their arrows. So longer range, longer endurance, it drove us to the need for an unmanned aircraft to satisfy that mission. You know, although you could go with something that was like an A6 for the 21st century, we determined that the longer missions that would be necessary for some of these operations might drive you to an unmanned variant to do them. Uh, and this would be not just for strike, but this would also be to support anti-submarine warfare, to support anti-surface warfare, and air defense. Uh, because as we transition to an environment where uh, what's more important is the capability of your missile, perhaps, your air-to-air -air missile, than of your aircraft itself. You know, an attack aircraft that's got long range and endurance and decent payload capacity is maybe a more useful air defense aircraft than a swift, short range, shorter endurance fighter. So those are some of the kind of key elements we saw as being necessary in that future air wing. Brian McGrath, any uh, further comments? I can't improve on that. <laughs> All right, great, thank you. Um, so with this also, as we look at, and I think Brian, you touched, uh, Brian Clark, you touched a little bit on your remarks of um, in the operation of these, uh, not just the carrier and the air wing, but the carrier strike group itself, right, in these um, more deny degraded, higher, uh, great power competition environments. Um, so I guess any thoughts any of, you got, any of you have on what changes we need to do um, to, right, to the whether it's the DDGs, future service combatant, those type of things that will make right the strike group itself, uh, whether operating alone or in multi-carrier operations, to help, uh, again, make this uh, more effective, uh, both the defense and even getting back on the offensive piece. Good. No, you, okay. Okay. So, uh, so the discussion we had in the um, in the in the carrier wing study is very similar to the one that we had in the uh, fleet architecture study to say 
We need to improve the defensive capacity of our surface combatants so that they can uh, be able to get into the salvo competition with an adversary. So if you look at a country like a China or even a Russia, they are going to base their calculus on whether they want to attack on the likelihood of success based on how many weapons can they deliver against a particular target, what's the prediction with regard to that target's defensive capacity, and if you think you can achieve a degree of overmatch, you might be more you know, encouraged to, to begin an operation and, and start an act of aggression. So by increasing the defensive capacity of our surface combatants, be they operating in a small surface action group or whether they're in a carrier strike group, you can start to drive that salvo competition and the calculus of your enemy to increase the uncertainty with which he has you know, regarding his attack. Uh, when it comes to deterrence, and this is exactly what Brian talked about, which I thought was an ex a terrific point, is that you know, it's about conventional deterrence as an element of great power competition, not necessarily about winning phase three of a major combat operation. So if you can increase that defensive capacity, you can drive that calculus. So things like shorter range interceptors you can carry in quad packs that give you a larger capacity or directed energy weapons or a greater reliance on electronic warfare, improvements to Aegis combat system that allow you to better manage the use of hard kill versus soft kill, um, adding hypervelocity projectile to your gun systems and um, perhaps um, even increasing the number of service combatants in a carrier strike group. Those are all elements of increasing that defensive capacity. Brian? You know, I, I know your question was, I think, specific to what surface ships can do, but I have, a, um, I have an idea. It's, I don't think it's original, but um, we, we think about when we, when we look at those maps that, that Brian shows and that the Intel community shows, and it has like a pizza wedge coming out from China out into the South China Sea that essentially makes you believe it's a no-go zone, right? And, you know, they've got... They've got perfect knowledge of everything happening within that pizza wedge. The, the truth is far from that. Um, what, their ability to surveil that space is dependent on many factors, day or night. What are, what's the temperature? What comm paths are moving, uh, are, are effective in, in, that, uh, in that atmosphere? Um, the, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is we need, our commanders need a real-time sort of heat map that shows based on, you know, where, where their sensors are and what kind of sensors they are to the extent that we know where are the opportunities, where are the cooler spots within that heat map that we can then exploit for for operations. Um, wh where are the places where attrition or where combat uh, where, where combat, you know, our, our, the effects of our combat have created additional opportunities that we can build out from. We don't have that, uh, and it's something I would like to. Again, it could. It, it also it, it involves the water column. You know, if 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 there are places where the water column uh, is hostile to submarine operations, that might not be a bad place for ships to operate. Uh, I don't think we have an integrated view of the battle space like that, and it's something I'd like to see technologists getting on. So I would just state, uh, you know, first of all, one of the things I'd say I, I like about uh, Brian's charts as well is I like the fact that it focuses on China. We're in a competition with China. If there's going to be a next war, the next war is going to be with China. And we're at last starting to stay that. We're not talking about Russia. Everyone else likes to talk about Russia. We're not talking about Iran. I know that that's got a lot of buzz. Not talking about North Korea, although I'm worried about them getting missiles and nukes. We're talking about China. We're talking about China where you have a, a political uh, flag officer over there making statements that he thinks it's time to jump ugly with the United States. Uh, so we're talking about a political military, not a professional military, and that's beginning to act a little bit more unstable with every passing day. Another aspect of this that I'd like to touch on is that when we talk about the carrier being relevant in the future, that's, that's part and parcel with the 355 ship Navy. The carrier does not remain relevant unless it's surrounded and supported by a Navy that's large enough to provide it with defensive capabilities. So you need to have, you know, the increased size of the fleet in order to build back up that, that carrier strike group so that it has both defensive and offensive and you bring balance back into that loadout. And then the other thing is continue to make the investments, not just in, in the missiles, although missiles are important and we need a whole new generation of missiles. I mean, the Tomahawk, I mean, Tomahawk predates me and I'm retired out of the Navy, 
Okay, so we need a whole new generation of missiles that are long range, boost glide, hypersonic. We need that, okay? We also need directed energy. We need electromagnetics. I mean, we've been five years away from a DE weapon for 25 years. So we need to get that across the finish line and we need to look at the other things that are coming. And then we need to make sure that these new ships, uh, be they the new frigate or for that matter, uh, what we're gonna do with these three zoom waltz, because I see that we finally got uh, the Lyndon Baines Johnson, a uh, ship name I never thought I would hear, uh, flooded up in, uh, in Bath. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the proper capabilities in the fleet to be able to keep the fleet as a system relevant going forward. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and so you know, Brian McGrath, your comments there on the, uh, I think, almost a combined electromagnetic uh, range of the day and in a sense of what's going on. It reminds me, as Brian and I know, as, as being submariners, we, we would... Uh, we constantly were, uh, you know, monitoring the acoustic environment and the and the water environment of temperature, salinity, and things. So we knew the acoustic range of the day, and we're monitoring that as, you know, it gets noisy, tougher to hear the bad guy, uh, tougher him to hear us, and as it changes, that could drastically change. And I think even CNO, I think, has said something about this, of wanting that we're, we're very – the U.S. Navy, we do a very poor job of understanding the electromagnetic environment um, and not just fully, not just looking at what the adversary is emitting, but even ourselves. And, and uh, when we think we're an MCON, we're often not. Um, and with that, in, in one last question, you're touching on also what, Brian, you said about the, you know, the hider finder piece, right? And it's getting easier and easier for the finders with more advanced ISR capabilities, um, both um, UAVs, um, space-based, and with those, and you know, especially for you know that can detect you know helint and, and emissions and, and pinpoint locator forces. Um, a lot of what we have been driven on our strategies, um, missile defense, even you know carrier air operations with e you know the E2s, uh, the Aegis. We're rotating, we're radiating, sending out there to make our to make it work that's also making us vulnerable. Uh, so la I guess the last question, thoughts you have on CONOPS new capabilities we need to be more um, passive and less detectable, but still being able to do some of the mission sets? Uh, yeah, so in the, in the air wing study, we talk about some of these new CONOPS uh, focused on passive detection and multi-static detection as being the primary you know, modalities going forward. Um, there's a lot of advancements happening in passive detection when you think about um, capabilities like uh, infrared, obviously infrared search and, tra and track we're familiar with. There's new uh, uh, mid-wave and, and long-wave IR capabilities that are enhancing the range at which you can do things like infrared tracking of uh, a target. Uh, passive radar or passive coherent location where you use the background uh, emissions of other radiators in the area, so cell towers, TV towers, et cetera, to get a radar picture of a contact that might be in that area. Um, that's, that's something that's been done for a long time and certainly a capability we could exploit in the future. Um, uh, sonar, uh, acoustics can give you a way to do tracking of service contacts that you know, we don't exploit nearly as much as we probably could. Um, and multi-statics are a huge opportunity, you know, when you think about using um, emitters that are on unmanned vehicles like mauled or for something, for example, and then using that as the bi-static uh, you know, illuminator for a target, and then you act as a passive receiver. Those are all the, all the capabilities that I think we're going to have to use going forward, which sort of calls into question um, some of the investments that we're making on active monostatic radars, you know, as the primary detection uh, technology on some of our surface combatants. So we'll have to rethink that, except you know, maybe in the context of missile defense, it makes sense, but in other situations, you maybe don't want to be emitting, especially as a monostatic um, system. Exactly. Thank you. Gary or Brian, thoughts on this? Yeah. Uh, Brian hit the big ones, passive coherent location, multi-static operations, both of which feed into integrated fire control, uh, having you know, the, the shooter and the and the um, sensor don't have to be co-located or even the same chunk of water. Uh, and finally, uh, smarter weapons, we uh, active active seekers help in that that regard. Thanks, Gary. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to in the remaining time here. I'm going to turn it over and we'll uh, I'll, I'll take some uh, questions from the audience. So, uh, key thing is I've got uh, help here with a, a microphone. So. Raise your hand, please state your name and where you're from, and speak in the microphone. 
So uh, Ron O'Rourke, yeah, right there. So. Hi, I'm Ron O'Rourke from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, you know thank you for your... <laughs> <laughs> Should have had a seat all for you up here, Ron. <laughs> all for your presentations. There were a lot of uh, ideas in there that are worth considering. Uh, two points. Uh, the first is, although we talked quite a lot today about um, operating outside or from the outside of the adversary's defensive perimeter, depending on when and how the war starts, we could have carriers well inside the perimeter uh, at the outset of the crisis or the conflict. I know you didn't have time to talk about that. Some of Brian Clark's work, I kind of think, gets toward that, but it's something I think uh, to put into the conversational mix as well. We need to think about not only how to fight our way from the outside in, but uh, in situations where we're already well on the inside, even if we might not have preferred to be. Secondly, I, th I think the major emphasis for the meeting today was on the theme of ensuring the relevance of the carrier moving forward. There were a lot of great ideas worth considering from the speakers today about that. I'm going to add four more. Uh, one is we did not talk about uh, where these carriers are stationed because that influences uh, the chances of having carriers uh, in the right place at the right time when you want them. Uh, people have talked about the option of homeporting an additional carrier somewhere in the uh, Asia-Pacific region. Uh, another option would be to forward home port an additional carrier in the Mediterranean. We actually had a plan to do that back in the 1970s that fell through at the last moment. Uh, doing something like that could free up the remaining carriers to do more of that kind of training that Brian McGrath talked about, training and experimentation. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to endorse what Brian talked about, Brian McGrath, about the value of the F-35B, not necessarily as a competitor or a threat to CTOL aviation, but as something that can operate synergistically with it to open up new concepts of operation and to thereby make the sea toll carrier uh, more potentially more relevant or cost effective. The panel today talked about operating the F-35B uh, off of uh, uh, ships like the LHAs, uh, but they could operate off of other kinds of Navy ships as well, and they could operate off of austere land bases. I don't think we have fully digested the ways in which the advent of the F-35B in operating in conjunction with uh, CTOL aviation can improve potentially the cost effectiveness of the latter. Uh, third, uh, we talked a little bit toward the end here uh, about weapons, but mostly in terms of weapons for surface ships. Uh, another way to extend the effective range of the carrier air wing is to develop new air-launched weapons that are longer ranged, and not simply for striking other targets, although that obviously could be useful, but also for defending the air wing in the outer air battle. The United States canceled the Phoenix follow-on at the end of the Cold War. We might be getting back into a situation where uh, a weapon like that could be useful. And then finally, one more way to improve the, uh, the relevance or, or the competitiveness of the carrier in a situation of constrained resources and alternative ways of spending the money uh, is to bring down uh, the cost of the carrier strike group writ large. Uh, there were some comments about that during the panel today. Uh, Jerry mentioned bringing down the procurement cost of the carrier, but a lot of the cost of the carrier group is not the carrier, but the other ships, and a lot of the cost of the carrier group is not simply initial procurement costs, it's annual uh, operation and support costs. And Right now, we are building a Navy, for example, with a lot of DDG-51s that will be in it, 70 or 80 or more of them. They will represent a fair fraction moving forward of the annual operating and support costs of carrier strike groups or of any formations we put together. But we haven't really made any uh, major steps toward trying to reduce the annual operating and support costs of those ships or of many other kinds of surface ships. So one way of making the carrier more cost effective is to bring down the ONS costs uh, of the carrier group as a whole, both the carrier and the other ships. Uh, again, that's something we didn't have a chance to talk about, so I wanted to throw all these ideas out into the mix today. Thank you. Ron, thank you very much. I think some very uh, expert uh, insights there from you. Uh, so any additional questions? Uh, 
So James, right, right next to Ron there. Um, Eric Labs, I'm a Naval Analyst for the Congressional Budget Office. I have, I have two questions, one for the panel, one for more for Brian McGrath than anybody else. The, the broader question is, um, there was a discussion, and I think all your points about the carrier air wing are well taken, but I'm wondering about the effects of time. So you have, we, we have three new carriers under construction, if you still count the Ford, the Ford itself, which, which I do. Um, so they're gonna be, they're gonna be around, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna be replacing three carriers that go out. So the carrier force is gonna be, you know, 10, 11 carriers through about 2040. The question then becomes, do we keep building these things as technology and, and sophistication of, of other countries' capabilities improve? And so there's some question I'd like to address. It's not that, it's not a question of we, when these people criticize carriers, we're gonna throw these carriers away. We're not, we're gonna keep them in their fleet. There's gonna be a lot of them in the fleet for a very long period of time. The question is, do we keep building them over and over again? Nine years to build one, a couple more years to sort of get it ready to deploy, and then 50 years service life. So you're talking about 2080, 2090. Um, and and term, if you could kind of address whether the relevance of that. The, the individual question I had for Brian, and, and to some degree, Brian Clark picked up on this too, you had a discussion about the difference between conventional deterrence and sort of the fighting, the winning of the, uh, uh, you know, the capabilities of fighting and winning, winning the war, that you know, perhaps resources would be better spent on, if you're trying to worry about fighting and winning the big conventional war with China, rather than on deterrence. I'm not, but you think you, you need to spend money on that deterrence side of it. I don't understand how you divide those two. To me, if you can fight and win the war, that's what makes your force a, con a powerful conventional deterrent. If you're saying that you are that by spending money on conventional deterrence, you are somehow weakening your ability to fight and win the big war, that's weakening your conventional deterrence, at least the way I think about it. Thank you, Eric. Um, Brian, over to you. All right, I'll take this second one. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of armchair admiraling that goes on in the war, in a war with China, that suggests we just flush a bunch of uh, SSNs in, and we hang back and shoot long range, long range missiles. And so it's a battle of missiles. You hear people talking about this battle of missiles all the time. If we wanted to win that war, the Navy would look very, very different than the Navy we're building. That was, so when I talk about the difference between winning the war and deterring the war, I think a war winning force, we would have 100 SSNs and we would have just gobs and gobs of long range missiles. Um, the deterring of that war, and this is where it gets to you know, the magical unicorn uh, that Jerry was talking about earlier. Um, one component of conventional deterrence is, to, is the American flag flying from a halyard somewhere on a ship and American beating hearts uh, on that ship that, make sh that, that, that give the potential aggressor the idea that, but through them will you attain your, uh, will you attain your, your, your goals in this fight. Uh, so there is a force structure difference, in my view, from a Navy that was all about winning great power war and one that has to win it and deter it. And that's where, for instance, surface forces, I think, have a, an outsized role in the deterrence of war as opposed to the early stages of winning war. Um, so when I, 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 we, I think we got in this conversation a little bit last week and we never finished it, but that, that's where I am on that. Uh, that there is a there are a series of capabilities we would want if all we were worried about was beating China into submission. Um, convincing them not to take that first shot is a different navy. I, I want to chime in on that as well because I, I I use a little bit different vernacular in that I think there's a balance that we need between the preserving the peace force and the winning the war force, uh, and I think naval presence, um, which is being uh, talk down amongst certain circles right now that want to make an investment in, in sort of a high-end, high capability. Let's, let's, let's push for that, that the war winning force maximize that investment as opposed to trying to continue to maintain naval presence 
But I think that naval presence has been the way that this country for most of the last 70 years has bled off tensions around the world and demonstrated the area where we have interest and we're ready to stand to and, and, and demonstrate our resolve and our interest in working with our allies and partners. And unfortunately, we've continued to build sort of more and more tend towards a high-end force which is, I think, one of the importance of getting back to the FFGX program and getting frigates back into the fleet to do that day-to-day -day pre, uh, peace preservation force uh, that's out there uh, so that we, you know, the, the idea that the, the John S. McCain was doing a FONOPS uh, two days before the collision, you know, why, why do I have the high-end BMD-capable ship from Desron 15 down doing a FONOPS? Where was the frigate to do that? Um, and, and I think we have to get more of that type of a platform back into the fleet. Um, yes, uh, I think that's a great question. I think on both of your questions, one of the answers is uh, it depends on what kind of fight we think China wants to have. Uh, because when we talk about deterring uh, through a war winning capability, then it depends on what the war is. And if China is not interested in having phase three of a conflict, preparing for it and basing our deterrence construct on that is maybe not the best way to use our money. Because if they intend to have a protracted conflict that sort of yeah, it goes from a gray zone into a long-term phase one engagement that they will eventually cause us to walk away from, that's a different fight. And how do we deter that? How do we deter them from opportunistically t trying to steal a march on us during that phase one engagement? Okay, well, then maybe that's a force that's you know, maybe got the ability to use missiles to prevent them from being able to take some quick uh, gain, um, but then has the ability to continue operations for a long period of time. And a missile-based force doesn't give you that ability to do multiple you know, salvos of, of uh, weapons over a long period of time because you eventually run out of weapons and have to reload and there's a limited supply of them. Whereas the carrier air wing maybe provides a more protract or the ability to sustain operations over a more protracted period of time. Um, and I think when you think about the, the relevance of a carrier in 50 years or 80 years, it kind of depends on where we think, you know, the evolution of warfare is going to go. Do we think something that has the ability to su provide sustained firepower over a longer period of time um, from some, you know, kind of remove is going to be a useful capability? Or do we think war is going to come down to the calculus of the aggressor saying, what can I achieve in a day? And that's going to be the basis of my you know, war plan. And if I think you've got enough missiles to keep me from being successful in a day, then I won't do it. Um, I don't know that that's what China's calculus is. I think their calculus is we're going to try to do something quickly to gain an advantage, um, push through your contact force. And if there's you know, nothing behind it, then we think we're going to you know, be able to do that and solidify our gains. Um, and then if you don't have anything to come back and prevent, prevent me from uh, kind of solidifying that position, then I'm going to be more encouraged in my aggression. And, I mean, just, I think that's the kind of stuff you got to think through in, in terms of deciding whether we're investing in something to deter or something to win the war. It depends on what war we're trying to win. All right, thank you. Any other further questions? Anybody, anybody? Hand in the back. Oh, one hand in the back. Thank you for all the panelists. Uh, I'm Phoenix Huang with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Um, just to have a little bit of a thing about the uh, current affairs and current situation that we learned that my knowledge might, have a, might be a little bit uh, less updated than your uh, Mr. Brian Clark's slides. Uh, we know that the F-35 has, uh, has got a new engine, which is F-135 engine, which can promote for better range of its uh, operation. And also, you, you mentioned about the DF-21D, the missiles that can cover 1,700 kilometers of the range. So in that matter, the US Navy is trying to counter with that kind of um, approach by extend the uh, Navy, the Naval Air Wings range uh, from, you know, by, um, by the F-135 F engine and also by the uh, unmanned tanker and also by the uh, longer missile, longer uh, cruise missiles, which can reach out the, to have a further uh, reach out of the uh, over 20, 20 hundred uh, kilometers. But th then there's another question about the DF-26. The DF-26 can, can cover like 
uh, 5,000, less than five, le less than 5,000 kil kilometers, which is like 4,000 kilometers. So how would the U.S. Navy to counter that measure to have an even longer range of the naval operations of the uh, DF-26 can cover? <laughs> well, I'd say uh, one thing uh, to think about is it's not about staying outside the range of the enemy's weapons. It's about ensuring that you've got defensive capacity and capability sufficient to deal with the threat that you're within range of. So the DF-26, even though it can reach a much longer range, will not be present in very large numbers. So it's a matter of, can I shoot down the number of DF-26s I think I could face uh, at any given time? Um, which you know, our argument is, you know, we think the carrier strike group, as it's being equipped for the future right now, would be able to do that uh, and wouldn't need to operate outside of DF-26 range. I, I don't have anything to add. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I fully agree. One last question here, Colin. Colin Stimson, the Heritage Foundation. Could any of you um, share your views on the two carrier buy, not only in terms of the efficiencies gained, which that's one of the primary arguments that's been made, but as a template for future purchases, um, not only in the surface combatant area, but other areas of naval warfare? I like multi-ship buys in general. I think they tend to bear fruit in flattening and in taking advantage of a flattened learning curve. Presumably, by the time we get to the two the two carrier buy, the Ford class learning curve will be understood. I think it's a reasonable uh, I think it's a reasonable idea, and it gets at a little bit a little bit of what um, what you were talking about with the time. Um, you'd have to do it more often than that for it to have much purchase. Um, but multi-year procurements are not don't solve everything, right? Um, you, there has to have been a learning curve. You have to have worked your way through those first couple of ships. I mean, we, we talk about Ford-class overruns, but Ford-class cost overruns are about average for first of their class overruns across the fleet across the last 50 years. Um, we... We are involved in this pernicious cycle in which the Congress tells the Navy, here's about what we'll take the Navy for, for what the ship can cost. The Navy goes off and, and, and fudges it and comes back and says, here, the ship costs this. They get halfway into the construction. It costs more. Congress gives them money. It's, a, it's an interesting cycle. Um, uh, you get out of that cycle once you've got that first couple of ships out of the way, and then you can more confidently go to multi-year procurement, give the industry the, the um, dependability, workforce uh, stabilization that they desire, profit, they get, to, they get to book revenue essentially for years on end, uh, which is good for their shareholders. It, it's good for a lot of people, but you have to get through that first couple of ships first. I don't like the idea of doing multi-year procurement on development products projects. I hope that answers your question. So uh, the one thing I, I'm concerned about, one, is we really do need to solve the, the carrier air wing problem, um, you know, before you essentially put another $13 billion into a second asset. But I understand that there's an efficiency there, that there might be anywhere from, you know, two and a half to higher number of billions of dollars saved by going that way, and that it has impacts elsewhere in the defense industrial base. I love those arguments. One question that I want to know is, if, if I go after that, what am I giving up? Is that going to take away 8, 10, 12 frigates? Is that taking away other aspects of the force? Because uh, or did I get additional money plussed up by the Congress to buy that second carrier? Or do I have to take away from something else in my production line? Because the idea of getting balance back into the fleet, uh, submarines, frigates, destroyers, even the next large surface combatant that, uh, that we're beginning to talk about now, uh, even if we haven't selected the frigate uh, down select yet, um, you know, is any part of that second carrier going to take away from those other things? Because those are critical elements of a balanced fleet uh, architecture as well, and we need to make sure that's there. So I'm all about efficiency. Um, you know, I, I understand the historical analogy with Reagan's buildup and the two carrier buy that happened in the mid 1980s, uh, but at the same time, I want to make sure that that other aspects of the buildup. 
uh, that went along with that Reagan buildup are also in place and that we're seeing parallels in all tracks of shipbuilding uh, and not just in the CVNs. I, I would say if you're if it depends on when you have to pay for them. I mean, so uh, you can buy two at once, and if you can stretch out the payment for them you know, over the uh, equivalent period of time as you might have paid for them originally, then it may not be that bad because um, clearly not going to build two at a time um, because they physically cannot build two at a time. Uh, so if you're contracting to buy two, then I think it would make sense to uh, to do that and take the savings and use the savings to improve the carrier air wing. Um, but if for some reason you have to like pay for both of them at the same time up front, well, then that money is probably better spent on you know other parts of the fleet in the near term. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Brian and um, Clark on the last piece too. That yeah, if we can get the savings, get the efficiencies, um, right? You never want to do it on the first two ships um, because of that learning curve. Especially, I think the four class. We're, what we're seeing some of the things right is is also with a new class, you get cost overruns, you get issues. It, but it's, I think history shows too, if you're, if you're introducing several new technologies in a new class, like we are in the Ford class, um, with EMALs, arresting gear, new, uh, new elevators, radars, then those, uh, those delays and cost overruns tend to increase. Um, but also, yes, if, if I can spread it out, but we can't, we can't handle a big bow wave in you know, one or two years, um, that would drastically impact the rest of the long-range, you know, ship and building plan and, and, the, and that balance piece. Ron? Yeah, just a quick addendum. Um, I think the question asked whether a two-pick will buy the case, then it's not that the carriers are doing this as an advanced comparison of fleets, it's that the carriers would be following the fleets of multi-nation classes that have been done widely in other parts of the fleet, especially in the attack submarines and the tour programs, but more recently even in other kinds of programs like the Johnny English class of radar. And so it would be following the fleet that it has now been established by, uh, by other builders. And the other thing to mention is that the carriers are currently at legislative So regardless of whether you're contracting two ships separately or under a single target in a, under a single contract, your costs will be spread out. Uh, your two years of advance, your two years of maintenance, your six years of fixing, the costs will be spread out. Oh, my, my point was is it two right. on top of each other? Right. I mean, my point is, how, <laughs> is it, is it going to be you're, you're paying for two carriers over the same six years, or are you spreading out the investment that's, in that 12, that's what I'm over 12 years? What, what, we don't know the form right. of the two Right. Pace more or less where they are yeah. right now, then the incremental funding uh, of those carriers will not right. be that much different than it would be if they were kept separate. And in fact, if there are some economic corresponding differences or components of the cost story, there will be some forward loading of the funding, uh, but not in the sense of paying for right. carriers. Right. Right. Thank you. I'd like to thank our audience both here. Uh, and on the live stream, and especially uh, my distinguished panelists here for uh, giving up uh, a lot of their precious time today, uh, both to prepare and uh, be here for the panel, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.